Thank you all for joining us today. I am Sheila Burt, Associate Director at the Muriel McQueen Ferguson Center. The center is dedicated to collaborative action-oriented research and education to understand and prevent family violence, violence against women and children. The center was established through the collaborative efforts of the University of New Brunswick and the Muriel McQueen Ferguson Foundation. I would like to acknowledge uh, that the Muriel McQueen Ferguson Center for Family Violence Research resides on the unsurrendered and unceded traditional lands of the Wolistiqua, Mi'kmaq, and Passamaquoddy peoples. This territory upon which we conduct our work is covered by the Treaties of Peace and Friendship, which the Wolistuk and Mi'kmaq peoples first signed with the British Crown in 1725. The treaties did not deal with the surrender of lands and resources, but in fact recognized Mi'kmaq and Wolistiqua title and established the rules for what was to be an ongoing relationship between nations. It is important for us to recognize as we work together to decolonize our thoughts and practices that the land upon which we live nurtures and protects us, our families, our friends, as well as the colleagues and students connected to us. I encourage you to reflect on the critical task of truth and reconciliation as we move forward together. The presentation portion of today's event will be recorded and made available on our website, probably within the next couple of weeks. As we're using the webinar function today of Zoom, your video and sound are automatically turned off. We have some time allocated following the presentation for a question and answer period with the presenter. Um, to participate in this portion, uh, you could just post your questions using the Q&A found at the bottom of your screen, and you don't need to wait till the end, so if, as Ardith is going through um, her presentation, if a question comes up, it's good for you to put it in that Q&A, um, post it right away, but we will address it at the end. Um, also, we will be providing a link at the very end of this webinar today just to give us some feedback on the presentation. Um, feedback is always important for us as it informs um, us to make necessary improvements for future sessions. So I encourage you to, to participate in that, filling out the evaluation. So I'd like to say, first of all, thank you to Dr. Ardith Wynack for agreeing to put this presentation on today. Uh, Dr. White Act is an Associate Professor of Sociology at Mount Allison University and a Research Fellow of the Muriel McQueen Ferguson Center. She writes and researches, researches with survivors of family and state violence and has 20 plus years of experience working in the field of gender-based violence with both sur survivors and offenders. She has worked as a frontline victim service worker a youth support worker for teens coming out of juvenile detention, and a program facilitator with men and women in the federal prison system. She has worked in Bosnia as a disarmament educator and has experience working with both local and international NGOs on anti-violence campaigns. She is an investigator on multiple research projects. Her research considers the role of healthcare and legal institutions in responding to the harms of violence, with attention to the role of community-based organizations and offering non-carceral approaches to violence, distress, and self-harm. Her recent book, Insurgent Love, Abolition and Domestic Homicide, reflects a multi-year SSHRC research project that explored transformative and non-carceral approaches to supporting family violence survivors who are at high risk for homicide. She lives and teaches on unceded Mi'kmaq territory. And with that, I would like to now turn it over to you, Artis. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Quick audio check. Can everybody hear me okay? Give me a thumbs up reaction if you don't mind. Awesome. Okay. So um, thank you all for coming uh, right before a long weekend to talk about a really heavy subject matter. And we are living in very heavy time. So if you feel like leaving halfway through, I will not be offended. Um, do what works for you. But I do promise I will end on a happy note. 
So I'm going to do my best to cover a lot of ground today in a short amount of time. I'm realizing that's the downside of writing a book. It's really hard to give a half hour talk after you've completed a book length argument. Um, so I am going to stick to a script. I'm sorry if it's boring if I'm reading for parts of this, but um, definitely do interrupt me if you need me to slow down or go back. Um, but for the most part, today, I want to begin by disrupting the way that we tell stories about and frame the causes and solutions to domestic homicides and mass casualties. Specifically, I'm going to talk very briefly here and there about the Montreal massacre, the port of peak tragedy, the Desmond tragedy, and I may reference at times um, an intimate partner homicide in my own social circle. I wanna outline why I have abandoned carceral feminism in favor of listening to black feminists who have for decades crafted a much more nuanced way to foster transformative pathways to ending gender-based violence. I want to open the door to a new kind of story that we tell about domestic homicide and mass casualties that are rooted in misogyny. But I want this door to open to a pathway that doesn't turn to police and prisons as our primary means of ensuring safety, because that has not been working. And I do not believe, based on the best evidence, that it will. I may not convince you today to become an abolitionist feminist, but my hope is that you will later, perhaps during the summer, turn to the work of Angela Davis, Beth Ritchie, Miriam Kaba, Robin Maynard, L. Jones, and others who remind us that police and prisons, rather than building cultures of safety, actually work to teach and promote coercive control in our homes and communities. So just a little bit about my book. If you're interested in following up on longer versions of my argument, you can get it from Fernwood Press. But before we begin, I want to review. So what is carceral feminism? So this is a quote from an article that Victoria Law uh, published in Jacobin Mag um, just over a decade ago, but a decade ago. And she writes, the carceral variant of feminism continues to be the predominant form. While its adherents would likely reject the descriptor, carceral feminism describes an approach that sees increased policing, prosecution, and imprisonment as the primary solution to violence against women. This is the kind of feminism that raised me. However, I am now what Lee Goodmark calls herself in her Twitter handle, a recovering carceral feminist. And if you have not yet read the work of Lee Goodmark, please add it to your summer reading list. She wrote a brilliant book about decriminalizing domestic violence in favor of building balanced and comprehensive policy solutions across government and the nonprofit sector. In relation to carceral feminism, I want to highlight an argument made by Beth Ritchie about what she calls the prison nation. Ritchie points out that carceral feminism becomes the dominant and mainstream voice in cultures that seek to scapegoat particular members of society as the cause of violence in ways that work to conceal how that same violence is taught and maintained as a whole. So this is the bad apples approach to confronting violence. The idea that we can end endemic violence by locking up a small few obscures the real causes of such violence. Black and indigenous feminisms show us that if we accept that our settler colonial nation was founded on violence and conquest, and that cultures of objectification, violence, and coercion permeate our entire system, then we have to accept that incarcerating a single abuser does little to prevent someone else from becoming an abuser. So what is abolition feminism? There's a lot of answers to that question. And I would encourage you, if you're interested, to explore the many answers to that question in a new title out from Davis, Dent, Miners, and Ritchie on Haymarket Books called Abolition Feminism Now. I selected the quote on the slide because of the first line. We hold people accountable and believe that people can change. And this is a really important thing. In settler cultures, we often fall into an either or form of Eurocentric thinking where we think that we can't believe in the best in someone and also hold them accountable for the worst that they've done. 
For me, abolition feminism is a feminism that seeks to transform the conditions that teach violence without resorting to police prosecution and prisons as the primary means to be safe. It's a feminism that is committed to defunding police in favor of funding the kinds of safety and healing services that survivors and perpetrators need. It's a feminism that acknowledges how state violence harms Black, Indigenous, and other racialized and gender diverse people every day. So policing hasn't failed due to lack of training and resources. Indeed, in most places, we can say that policing receives probably more funding than most community services combined. Policing and incarceration fails because it is a manifestation of the same coercion that we see in high-risk family violence settings, and I mean high risk for homicide. From an abolitionist feminist perspective, I need to argue that policing is a manifestation of the same forms of coercion, surveillance, and strategic violence that is linked to domestic homicide because we can't end violence by reinvesting in violence with every new police budget. So I need to assert that state violence is gender-based violence, because when the dominant voice in how we advocate for solutions to victims and survivors of violence, when that dominant voice really focuses on creating new laws, uh, training police, that sort of thing, we tend to miss the fact the police engage in gender-based violence both within the home and on the job. Um, these solutions of just improving police training, tabling new bills, prosecuting more perpetrators, keeping them in jail for longer, these have not been effective. These coercive solutions to gender-based violence ignore the fact that police assault women at higher rates than the general public, which is something we need to talk about more in the DV community. I have an example here about um, many of you might be familiar with what happened in Val d'Or, Quebec. Headline about police sexual and physical violence against Indigenous women. 37 complaints were made against six different officers for assault. Not a single charge was laid. After a year long investigation by Montreal police, so a different police force was brought in to investigate, Crown, Crown prosecutors decided that there wasn't enough evidence to file criminal charges against the six officers. So also important to point out that survivors throughout the process of investigation by Montreal police were also harassed by private investigators hired by the police union. Amidst the failure of prosecuting any of the six officers involved, a province-wide commission was then set up to investigate. They determined that police are racist. Black, Indigenous, and other racialized women have been saying this for decades. So this should not be news. We should not have any more commissions set up to determine the problems in policing because Black feminists specifically have been talking about it for a very long time. So my question is why then, knowing that these problems are endemic across both the RCMP and municipal police forces, why are we continuing to write letters and demand new laws to be enforced by the same officers we know to be abusing and harassing the same women we claim to represent? The problems in policing will not go away with higher budgets. In the book, Preventing Domestic Homicides, there is a chapter about domestic homicide and police and military families. McCory and others, including Peter Jaff and Verona Singer, reviewed the Lionel Desmond tragedy. They outline how workplace culture in policing and military um, groups echo the patterns of patriarchal abuse in the home. Police are taught to use violence to enforce their jurisdiction. Policing is authoritarian. It follows a command structure that also relies on strategic violence, which is used to frighten unruly citizens into submitting to police authority, and by extension, the authority of the state. Police are taught to surveil, to chase, and to subdue those who are perceived to pose a risk to the rule of law, their law. It sounds familiar, right? To those of us who study patterns in domestic violence, it's clear that police are a manifestation of the same kinds of patriarchal authority we see in family violence. 
I work really closely um, with a small handful of women who formerly worked as police officers. They all left policing. Some became whistleblowers and tried to draw attention to the gender-based violence that was going on, the corruption that was happening in their police forces. Some of them have had to hire private security just to keep themselves safe in becoming a whistleblower against corruption in policing. And so I say this to draw attention to the fact, you know, one of the women that I work with is also was a use of force instructor for police in Ontario. And so if women who are police officers who are teaching about use of force to young police officers, when they are now seeing that we need to abolish the police, I think we need to be listening to them within the domestic violence community. So I included this slide because it's a really great way to show the difference between the traditional approach of understanding domestic violence as something that only exists within the home and the abolitionist feminist approach that understands the power and control wheel of abuse as coming both from the state and broader collective structures and also smaller intimate kinship networks in the home. And within this understanding of power and control, we see that, for example, coercion and threats exist both within state violence and within violence in the home as well. And so this was adapted by someone named Monica Cosby. And if anyone wants a high res version of this, I'm happy to send it to you with the reference information. But my challenge to all of you who are so lovely and agreeing to sit down and listen to me talk on this cloudy afternoon, my challenge to you is to try and think in these terms about family violence even when we are faced with violence of unimaginable scale, even when we are frightened of the perpetrator, and even when we struggle to understand how to achieve safety without police and prisons, because we have a lot of work to do in figuring out the how. The carceral system is so embedded within all of us and our thinking that it forecloses on imaginative or transformative solutions before we even have a chance to voice them. And I think it's okay to stumble or to struggle for answers when we ask the question, how do we respond to high risk forms of family violence, domestic homicide and mass casualties from an abolitionist feminist position? This is a question I was forced to ask after almost two decades of working with survivors and perpetrators in the federal prison system, but also found myself sitting on a whole cold, long wooden bench in a courtroom during the trial of a friend of mine who killed his girlfriend. And I have to say that as someone who also sat through a trial as an abolitionist feminist, I really wanted that person convicted and I really wanted that person to receive a life sentence. So all of this to say that when I talk about abolitionist feminism, I don't talk about it as a moral high ground that all parts of us are gonna be comfortable with at any given time. I say this as someone who knows that dealing with violence is complex and our emotions and our affect can sometimes push us into different positions at different stages of the healing journey. So in this way, I wanna discourage against any form of shaming for survivors who might wanna go through a criminal justice process. Because if that's what makes sense to a survivor, I do support that, okay? So just, I'm trying to lay it out in philosophical abstract terms as concisely as I can, but I wanna acknowledge that there's a gray area and we're never gonna get it 100% right. So moving into talking about different types of domestic violence so that we can understand the specifics of high risk family violence, meaning high risk for homicide. I follow the work of Johnson on typologies of domestic violence. So all this, this work is fairly new and I think there's a lot of work to be done in figuring out how these typologies can be culturally specific, how they can better apply to queer and gender non-conforming folks and their relationships. I do think it is really helpful in delineating the differences in uh, family violence patterns, because in my experience, there was a very clear difference to me in patterns. So situational couple violence as described by Johnson is violence that arises in reaction to situational stressors. The power imbalance within a couple is much less stark 
physical injury and death can and does occur. So in talking about situational couple violence, uh, I don't want to minimize the harms it might present. However, it is the most common form of family violence and it can be addressed through pathways that exist in a decriminalization framework. Situational couple violence does not require incarceration to stop the violence. Domestic violence courts might be a start, but what about community-based family support programs that emo involve emotionally focused therapy, DV counseling for perpetrators, healing supports for children, long-term mandated supporting of the whole family, substance abuse programs where necessary. All of these things are what survivors often ask for. And research has shown over and over again that survivors are more likely to be interested in those pathways than in a prosecute and punish pathway. Specifically where women are generally more economically dependent on a partner. So incarceration and having a criminal record can financially devastate a family. But what about that other kind of relationship? The one I wanna focus a little bit more on today. Course of control as Johnson talks about it or Evan Stark who wrote a book um, framing it as intimate terrorism is a much more dangerous situation, both for those who are living in that kind of violence and for those who seek to intervene. The power imbalance is much more steep and abusers engage in strategic acts of violence to instill control through fear. Surveillance and stalking is more common and these relationships are much more likely to end in homicide. And also this abuse can occur without physical violence. Um, which is something that, again, calls into question the use of course of control laws, which I'm gonna talk about in a minute. A course of control abuser sees their partner and their family as theirs to possess. They seek security and relief from their distress through a tightening of their hold on their partners. They experience precarity and dispossession in a hyper-masculine global marketplace that makes them the foot soldiers of capital. And they seek to remedy their dispossession, experienced often through job loss, occupational rejection, or rejection of a partner, by possessing their partners even more tightly and with more totality. I want to suggest that we cannot prevent the lethal objectification of women without addressing global economic systems that drive us to objectify, possess, and also destroy the land. And I'm gonna dig into that argument a little bit further. What I do wanna say now before we move on is that intervening in the course of control or intimate terrorist relationship is extremely dangerous, which is why those of us who tend to work um, often in the crisis shelter system, you see more relationships that are of the course of control type. So there is more hesitation to engage in abolitionist politics because of the danger that we feel in those particular relationships. But even if we agree that abolitionist feminism makes a compelling case, we have to grapple with the dangerousness of that kind of intervention. And I don't think abolitionist feminism should leave that piece out. The short answer is, however, abolitionist feminism is a pathway for understanding coercive control because the police have never and likely will never deal with these risks either. We are seeing this with the Mass Casualty Commission in real time right now. I wanted to suggest that really dangerous offenders like Mark Lupine, the perpetrator of the Montreal Massacre shooter, and the Porta Peak shooter are a product of cultures that valorize policing and military conquest. Mark Lupine was rejected from the Canadian military just a few years before the Montreal Massacre. And this was reported to have had a tremendous downward force trajectory on his mental health and his engagement with misogyny. The Porta Peak shooter, as we all know, was obsessed with police memorabilia. Lionel Desmond's slow descent into homicidal rage was triggered partly upon discharge from the Canadian military. All of these men ascribed to hyper-masculine ideals of policing and military service. And I believe that unless we stop our passive acceptance of state violence and how we seek to solve problems of gender-based violence, 
we will continue to suffer mass casualty events. Course of control historically began with colonization in the Americas. We cannot combat it without accepting where it came from and why it persists. And rather than making policing necessary, the dangers posed by coercive control or intimate terrorist abusers emphasize the urgency and necessity for abolition, transformative justice, and defunding and demilitarizing police and the military. So Mike Goldhawk points out that the early RCMP was instrumental in facilitating fraudulent land acquisition by the British. He documents how the RCMP used strategic violence to make an example of rebellious indigenous communities and striking workers. The RCMP was not established to maintain the safety and protection of settlers. It was established to seize territory and resources that its employers had no legitimate claim to. History shows us that the RCMP was established to terrify large populations of people so that they would not protest land theft and their exploitation through labor. And if you've been following the Mass Casualty Commission and also media coverage of the tragedy in Porta Peak, you will know that the shooter in the Porta Peak tragedy engaged in a series of attempts at fraud and illegitimate land claim in addition to engaging in gender-based violence. Surveillance, the use of strategic violence to create a total feeling of control, the removal of autonomy from others, the use of masculine hierarchies of command and rule. This is the history of RCMP and the history of how coercive control relations and intimate terrorism came to exist in our communities today. Intimate terrorism and intimate partner homicide was not a feature of everyday life prior to colonization. And I get into more of the history about this in my book if you want to explore it further. But trust me when I say that the imposition of intimate partner homicide is endemic to everyday life came through British colonization. So when we write op-eds and we write to our elected officials, those of us, and I include myself in this, we cry misogyny, misogyny, till we are blue in the face. We talk about it because we see it as the cause of violence and death for women and girls. But where did misogyny come from? It came from colonization. Our carceral system, our prison system, all of these were installed through colonization. The objectification of women as property was introduced through European marriage practices. The objectification of life and land was fostered through the emergence of racial capitalism. We cannot separate the objectification of women from the creation of private property and emergence of global capitalism. So when we are asked why we had a mass casualty, we must go further than saying misogyny. Because if we don't, we will end up getting a reinvestment into the RCMP, which is ultimately not gonna reduce the likelihood of it happening again. Indigenous Australian feminist Aileen Morton Robinson traces the history of what she calls the white possessive logic in the formation of settler colonialism. She writes, the mainstream as property owning subjects can possess the nation through their ontological relationship to capital their possessive investment in patriarchal white sovereignty is enhanced through private property ownership. This security produces an affect that is encapsulated in a sense of home and place, mobilizing an affirmation of white national identity that has surfaced as a result of the supposed heroic deeds of white men. When we refuse to acknowledge that on our territory, misogyny came through white supremacy and colonialism, we're not doing justice to survivors and we're not putting ourselves in the right place to think about prevention. So just to be honest, this is at the end of my teaching term, I perhaps I'm not as diplomatic as I should be about these things, but I have grown increasingly frustrated with feminist activism that is focused on amassing huge data sets 
on the killing of women and girls in order to prove the point that patriarchy and misogyny exists. You may have noticed that I use the term domestic homicide instead of femicide. I use the term family violence instead of intimate partner violence. I do this for a few reasons. In my work with survivors, I am reminded that family violence impacts children, elders, and bystanders. 20% of domestic homicides, approximately, depending on jurisdiction, involves the killing of children, elders, or those who tried to intervene. We also know that in many domestic homicides, the killer takes their own life, or at least attempts, and that's about half the cases. So it's very, very common. And I think that we need to be able to use language that accounts for complexity and accounts for the scale of the violence. How do we talk about the harm that a perpetrator poses to themselves and others at the same time? Because until we can do that, until we can grapple with that, we're not going to be able to envision prevention. I want to point out that men's violence against men is part of the cycle of violence. I have learned this through the work of Angela Davis. Just as ongoing patterns of state violence work to teach and reinforce family violence, men's violence against other men leads to violence against women. Certain strands of feminism seem more concerned with demonstrating that men are the problem than they are with fully understanding the roots of violence and demanding solutions that acknowledge the violence that Black and Indigenous women face at the hands of law enforcement. I don't disagree that misogyny is a problem, but when we focus on misogyny to the exclusion of all other mitigating factors, as white feminists, we work to conceal our own complicity in white supremacy, colonialism, and state violence. White carceral feminism works to naturalize men's violence, as if men, simply by being born men, are predisposed to misogyny. And I think that it's a very dangerous assumption to make because it forecloses any discussion on effective prevention or effective rehabilitation, which is ultimately what I want to see to honor lives lost and those we can save. And I must emphasize this in light of the striking similarities between the early life experiences of the Montreal massacre shooter and decades later, the Porta Peak shooter. They were both sons of mothers who were abused by a course of control abuser. They were both also abused by their fathers. Our collective social failure to respond to a father's abuse of his son is part of the story we need to be telling as feminists. And until we start telling those stories, we will not prevent the kinds of tragedies we saw in Cumberland County. Because reasons are not excuses. We do live in a patriarchal society that makes a lot of excuses for men's violence. And it puts us in a situation where it's very difficult to hear about the reasons, but I think that we do need to emphasize that reasons are not excuses and those reasons are necessary in order to prevent. For me, the story I want to tell is about how we were all terrorized by a mass shooter who dressed as a police officer and was obsessed with weapons and police memorabilia. And yet, a month later, a military air show, a historical display of Canadian conquest and state violence flew overhead to raise our spirits. A few days later, Captain Jennifer Casey was killed in a snowbird jet when the engine stalled. And I want that to be part of the story because it's a story about us. I wanna argue that police killings are domestic homicides too. It's an often cited statistic that a woman is killed every six days in Canada by her intimate partner, but police shot a civilian on average every six days in 2020. Overwhelmingly Black or Indigenous and overwhelmingly suffering mental health issues. Okay, so the risks that police pose to community are not evenly distributed. If we compare domestic homicides with police perpetrated homicides, we can see a startling number of similarities in how the perpetrators function in their day to day lives. And I want to argue that police perpetrated homicide and family violence homicide are twin problems with the same root cause.
So I have said this a lot recently. Um, there are a lot of folks right now that want to see coercive control laws on the books in Canada as a result of what happened in Porta Peak and through Cumberland County. So these laws, coercive control laws, are designed to prosecute the more dangerous kind of relationship I discussed earlier. But these laws won't work. I have here a quote on my slide from Sandra Walklate that outlines some of the reasons for their expected failure if that's the intervention we choose to move forward with in Canada. Sandra writes, the criminalization of course of control may fail women in two respects. First, it arguably fails at the conceptual level in misunderstanding the coercive nature of the law and inability to appreciate how this concept contributes to the process of erasing women's agency. Secondly, it fails at the experiential level in failing to see women's lives as a whole, particularly their reluctances to engage with criminal justice. Put simply, course of control fails to see responses to violence against women holistically, and in doing so, leaves the subject of law untouched. Just to continue on this point, where mandatory arrest and high-risk protocols coexist, racialized survivors have been criminalized. Course of control laws are difficult to prove and racialized people end up facing more state violence as a result of their imposition. In a five year period in Australia, almost all Aboriginal people killed by their partners were previously misidentified as a perpetrator by police. In a BBC Uncovered article, um, it was published that England and Wales made just over 7,000 arrests under new course of control laws. Only about 1,150 resulted in charges and there were about 250 convictions. So that's a 3.5% success rate. I think that survivors deserve better than an intervention with a 3.5% success rate. So I've tried to cover a lot of grounds fairly quickly, but I wanna move forward with some thoughts on a list of demands that don't rely on police and prisons as a solution for domestic homicide and mass casualties. So many of you who've done work in domestic violence might be familiar with Jacqueline Campbell's danger assessment questionnaire, which translates lots of research about the risk factors for intimate partner homicide into a questionnaire that can be used to determine the risk or the level of danger that someone might face of being killed by their partner. In most jurisdictions, police are tasked with some form of danger assessment when called to a domestic violence incident. In some places, a high-risk protocol is put in place, meaning that Police are asked to use a danger assessment questionnaire when they are called to a domestic violence situation. And then if the score is really high, then that survivor is then referred to a special high-risk protocol within a victim services agency. But I'd like to suggest that Campbell's danger assessment can offer a very different starting point for a transformative justice agenda that doesn't rely on police as players in the pathway of safety. So the first pathway to safety I want to talk about is disarmament. I mentioned before that I was raised by carceral feminism, but that isn't entirely true. As a feminist, I was raised in part by folks who were involved with Nova Scotia Voices of Women for Peace. I learned a lot from women in that movement, specifically about how we need to combat militarization. If we combat the militarization of our communities, we can do so by defunding police and disarming our neighbors. And if we take that power and control wheel seriously that I showed before that has intimate violence and state violence on either side, we can think about disarmament as something that involves defunding police. So this could mean gun buyback programs, which United Nations has used with success um, in post-conflict settings, and it's also been used and run through municipal agencies in the United States. And those actually get guns off the street. Without guns, 
Marco Pien, Lionel Desmond, and the Porta Peak shooter would have been significantly less dangerous, thus opening up pathways for different kinds of community intervention. The second pathway to safety, I would suggest, is empowering communities, families, and neighborhoods to do their own danger assessment. We need to build capacity by building literacy on family violence at the neighborhood level. Because if we can assess, assess our dangers for intervention at that level, then we can know when and how to intervene in the right ways. Black feminist work on transformative justice for sexual and gender-based violence and indigenous legal traditions offer alternatives to police intervention. Another pathway to safety without police, and this is something I'm really passionate about, and there's been some really great writing and activism uh, in Toronto and parts of the states recently on this. And that is the transformation of child protective services to move from mandated reporting of abuse to mandated supporting of families. Fear of child seizure is a major barrier to survivors coming forward. It is possible that our province would not have experienced a recent mass casualty had a survivor been supported rurally when abuse was suspected in that home. And of course, there has information that's come uh, to surface through the media that fear of child seizure had something to do with that. I think that having long-term housing and healing supports in rural and urban centers where child protective services are integrated and treat and heal and work with all parents would be an excellent way to build safety without police. So a fourth possible pathway um, involves public education to resist the normalization of stalking and surveillance. We live in a culture that is steeped in surveillance and constant monitoring of our every minute. Our digital lives are tracked endlessly. Our employers use productivity tracking software. It's become normal in our dating lives to creep, as we say, partners and their loved ones. We know that coercive control abusers use stalking and surveillance to maintain a culture of fear in the home. And I think we could do a better job of pushing back and fostering cultures of consent and freedom from being surveilled. And of course, Julie Lalonde has written a great book about her experiences, specifically with stalking after the end of a relationship. So the next two pathways towards transformation of the conditions that lead to domestic homicides have their own slides. The first is about racial capitalism. Committing to resist racial capitalism and the forces of objectification and exploitation that cause us so much misery. We cannot ignore the links between domestic homicide and the harmful precarity and insecurity brought about by neoliberal capitalism. We know that sudden unemployment or occupational crisis is one of the biggest predictors of domestic homicide and also a common precursor to workplace and other mass shootings. We know that the Montreal massacre shooter was inspired by a workplace shooter. All of this was triggered by rejection within the workforce. We need to talk about how men are socialized in settler colonial states to internalize the forces of occupation so deeply that their entire identity is bound up in their role in the global financial system. The forces of settler occupation installed European gender binary systems in order to secure the to total participation in what is a deeply exploitative and harmful workforce. And I have a quote from Nandita Sharma, who is an excellent thinker on this topic, that talks about how if we want to end the exploitation of women, we need to challenge capitalism. And we need to be engaging in programs that encourage men to do the same. And the final pathway to safety is something I'm really passionate about right now as well. I've been working with colleagues doing some community-based mental health research with youth recently. Both Lionel Desmond and Mark Lapine sought mental health treatment in Montreal prior to becoming perpetrators of homicide. 
my friend, Nicholas Butcher, who killed his girlfriend, Kristen Johnston, also sought inpatient treatment, coincidentally in Montreal. In every case, mental health practitioners were unable to treat the risk they posed to others while also dealing with the risks they posed to themselves. In almost every case, they were legally prevented from warning others, even if they did worry about the patient's capacity for violence. I think we need a drastic reimagining of our mental health care system, and it needs to be a feminist reimagining that challenges individual level prescriptions for what are collective social ills. We can start by integrating domestic violence treatment into free, accessible, universal mental health care. And this kind of care would require that we rethink how clinicians are trained. Their feelings of responsibility towards social problems within clinical treatment and improving access specifically in rural areas. Small community-based support clinics could provide interdisciplinary, long-term and appropriate early intervention treatments that can stop the cycle of violence. And I think that this could work in tandem with approaches to transforming child protective services so that these clinics could easily do double duty. And in the long run, they would be a lot cheaper than incarcerating someone. It costs like 175 grand a year or something like that to incarcerate someone in a federal facility. And I think we could do a lot more at the community level working in prevention. So on my second last slide, I do need to say a quick word about how utterly heartbroken I am about a growing tolerance for trans hatred in the domestic violence research and advocacy community, specifically around homicide. Carceral approaches to addressing family violence have allowed for our movement to be permeated with biological essentialism and trans misogyny. When we refuse to engage with the colonial and capitalist roots of state and family violence, we create the conditions for trans misogyny to grow. Biological essentialism leads to gender essentialism. The idea that our biological makeup causes innate, fixed, or universal gender attributes, that is a patriarchal idea, and I am seeing it more and more within the DV community. Trans exclusionary radicals in the anti-femicide community are like parasites who use violence against women and girls to justify their hatred of trans people. They become fixated on anatomy as a predictor of violence to the exclusion of the real causes. What kind of feminism allows this type of hatred to be openly discussed and tweeted about in conferences and events where survivors and their families should be placed at the center. The anti-femicide movement in the UK and in Canada is getting increasingly worse. I long for the day when the organizations I love and respect are brave enough to circulate a collective statement against trans hatred and trans misogyny. When a community that is so vital to building safety from misogynistic and white supremacist violence is clear in saying that we won't allow our movement against gender-based violence to become a recruitment site for hate groups against trans people. But as promised, I will end on a happy note. So let's take a minute with the words of Robin Maynard. In conversation with Leanne Beta Samasaki Simpson, Robin Maynard writes, what if we were to actually reimagine what it means to live on this continent in a way that didn't give that ethical priority to settler states or even to nation states more broadly? What would it mean to our relationships, to the places we're in and to our relationships to each other, our relationships with indigenous communities whose lands are still being occupied? The good news is that if we acknowledge that the source of so much of our misery is tied up with colonization and systems of racial capitalism, we have so much to gain by tackling these root problems at the source. Lots of birds, one stone. 
By moving closer to abolitionist feminism in our work against gender-based violence, we bring ourselves closer to the other movements for liberation. And in these collaborations, I believe that we'll find greater power to make a difference. Thank you.